we are recording. Get my screen together. All right, cool. All right, let's do it. Hello, kings and queens, and welcome to Affirmations of Excellence, the video edition, season two. I am your guide, Ariel Ellis. And in this new installment of Seasons and Shifts, which is the new series for the podcast, uh, I'm featuring some leading voices in spiritual, personal, and professional development. And as you know, uh, we're in a shift right now uh, all across the world. And when one season is up, and another one begins, life can get really uncertain. And as we talk about excellence on the podcast, it's really important to think about where does excellence fit into our lives when we're in a season, or a, a, a shift, or we're navigating that shift and trying to figure out how to enter a new season or come out of an old one. Um, there are some extraordinary guests that I have on the series, and I'm really, really excited to introduce this particular special guest who I've known pretty much all my life for the most part. Uh, I want to give him an opportunity to tell you about his background. I don't want to necessarily read a bio for you because, again, this is a very special guest. Uh, I'm going to introduce to you for this particular topic on this series uh, for Seasons and Shifts, we're going to talk about expectations and disappointments. And our special guest um, has some interesting things to share with us about that. Pastor Corey Sanders of the Movement Church at Homestead, Florida. Hi, Corey. What's happening? How you How doing? Are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So for Get the it. sake of everybody else's um, information, we're family. Yes. <laughs> You're yeah. our cousin. Yes. Yes. And no way back. Oh, God. And <laughs> so when I was thinking about some very important people, prominent folks, folks who have interesting stories, you were one of the people that came up, not only because, of course, your family, but because you have so much to share. You have so much wisdom to give. You have you have had an interesting path, an interesting career, and uh, you've had an interesting transition into ministry and the work that you do. And so I know that your take on excellence is going to be very important for our guests to be able to share. So give us some background about um, wh where you are, who you are, and um, how you got there. Well, I am originally from Memphis, Tennessee, former hip hop artist. So I, I for a, a good portion of my life, I traveled and toured doing music and doing hip hop. And it just opened up my world and expanded my mind in ways that um, allowed me to experience and see some stuff that maybe I wouldn't have seen if I would have just stayed where I was. And so I've always been connected spiritually. My mom, you know, made sure that we were going to be in service every Sunday morning. She didn't have many rules, but one of them were, if you lived in my house, we are going to a church service. And so I was connected to a, a church most of my life growing up called Breath of Life Christian Center. And so as a result, it was a great foundation for me uh, moving forward. Like many young people, obviously I got stories of straying away and, and, and doing some stuff that maybe, you know, I shouldn't have, but uh, it was extremely beneficial to me. And so it helped to shape me to the, to the point where it me, moved me to a space where I wanted to see leaders grow out of the dirt to grow out of the concrete, to grow out of the ugliness that, that we may call the hood. And so I could see that, you know, where I come from, guys didn't have a lot of access to things where they talked about excellence and pursuing, you know, your goals, unless it was connected to something like entertainment or sports. And so if it wasn't those two things, there wasn't a lot of conversation about excellence. It wasn't a lot of conversation about being your best. And so what did it look like for, for guys from, you know, uh, broken and desolate backgrounds and communities to be encouraged and motivated uh, leadership wise to be the leaders they're called to be? And that doesn't mean being a leader meant you had to run a Fortune 500 company or you had to pastor or you had to do something along those lines. You just needed to be a good leader to lead your family, you know, to lead your wives and lead your children or be a good leader to lead in your neighborhood or lead on your block. So, so I wanted to be a voice for urban leadership and what did that look like to kind of connect. And so you, you add that to the fact that I am a leader in a community along with being a pastor of a church. And so it made that possibility, it opened up a door that, that I felt like not many people were willing to walk into and to serve and love uh, a, a demographic of people who literally needed to know what it meant to lead and to serve in a greater capacity uh, in their community. Yeah, that's awesome. 
uh, with all of that, with the experiences that you had in community and in the music industry and now in ministry, can you perhaps figure out or, or pinpoint any signs or signals when you realize that um, you needed to make a shift? How do you know or how have you known? What, what signals and signs kind of pop up routinely for you in your life where you know it's time for a change? I think one big one, one big one. I mean, there are several and I'm not going to touch on all of them. This, this list isn't exhaustive, but one is when you start to let minor irritations become major problems. Like when you're, when you're starting to let minor things become a big problem, you may need to start looking towards a shift. Um, things that, and, and, and that doesn't mean, the shift doesn't just mean, oh, I walk away from this or I move away from this, but it may, it does, that is a sign that you need to make some changes. You need to do some things differently. And I think uh, all too often we, we say changes need to start with someone else versus starting with ourselves. And what, what I mean by that change is, I mean, you have to start with yourself first, first thinking, what is, that, what, what is it that I need to do to shift? What is it that I need to do to begin to make some changes? What is it that I need to do to maybe even shift my attitude mm -hmm. where I view this and look at this differently? And, and, and a lot of times, if your viewpoint changes, the whole circumstances, the whole situation changes. So I think that's one. I think two is when you, when you find yourself stuck in what was, when you, when you, you spend too much time looking behind you, uh, dang, I wish this was this, or I spent all my time thinking about something that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's time for a shift. And then I think also when you, when you're frozen by that, when you, when you're stuck, when you're like a deer in headlights and it makes you, uh, it causes you not to be able to move or to, to begin to progress forward it's time for a shift. And, and maybe when you're asking yourself the wrong question, meaning you're asking yourself more of why instead of what's next. Like mm -hmm. if we're spending all our time going, why, why me? Why did this happen? Why did this go on? And not really asking ourselves, what's the next move? Mm -hmm. What's the next decision I need to make? Mm -hmm. I think those are all signs that it's time for a shift. Yeah. That's significant. I posted, so today's Thursday for the folks who will be watching this later. Earlier today, I, this morning, I posted a, a, a th throwback Thursday on Instagram. And it was a picture of me at home in Memphis, happened to be at, at home and at a restaurant and with my family, with my mom and everybody. And I'm on my phone. And my mom just happened to snap a picture of me, like using my phone. I, no telling what I was doing on a Sunday, nonetheless, Corey, um, after church on my phone at the dinner table. And this is, of course, back, I don't know, maybe eight or so years ago when I was a publicist. And, and you remember those days. And so we probably have some similar experiences of trying to, of, of working in and around the entertainment industry. And it, it's literally that moment later when you realize that there's a life that you want to live and then there's a life that God wants you to live right yeah. mm -hmm. and you're and and you have to kind of navigate that shift in yeah. such a delicate way can you speak of a time where you realize that there was this moment where you recognize that you had an expectation that was not God's will <laughs> for sure I mean it was even before stepping into this role of pastoring. Honestly, I just thought music was going to be my life. Like I thought that was going to be how I was going to change the world. It was how I was going to be affect the world. Uh, uh, some people on this call may know a guy by the name of Lecrae. Uh, we went to school together, Minnesota State, and and what he has become um, is what I thought I would be. I mean, this is just to be really truthful. Even when he didn't believe that was possible, I always believed that was possible. And so, so when I stepped into this role of pastoring, there was a part of me that felt like I had got demoted. Like I had got, you know what I'm saying? Like I was, this was, you know, I was relegated to a community and a small community at that. I was, I was relegated to this, this role of just being in, you know, you know, you, you're starting from, from the bottom, so to speak, you know, as Drake would say, you know, you, you, you know, starting, I mean, there's a lot of entrepreneurial efforts that go into planting a church and, 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 and getting it off the ground, so to speak. And so, you know, there was a lot less 
fame and glory, so to speak, attached to it in my mind. I know we know a lot of celebrity pastors, so to speak, but in my mind, that wasn't the way I saw, you know, shepherding and caring for people, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, my expectation was different. I was like, God, yo, why didn't you give me this? You know, why didn't you let me have this? And so I remember uh, me and my family, we packed up and moved to San Antonio from Memphis. We were living in Memphis, we moved to San Antonio. We thought this was gonna be a fresh start. I was kind of stepping away from the music. Me and my wife thought we were gonna be, you know, soccer parents, you know, saying riding around in a minivan. You know, we had been artists, you know, all of our lives up to that point, you know, all of our marriage up to that point. And so it, we got to San Antonio and it was the, it was the worst. I mean, it was like, it was awful. It was the, we were the poorest we ever been. We, we didn't know anybody, we didn't have any. I mean, it was just crazy being there, but it was in that, in that brokenness, in that, in that space of disappointment that God began to kind of lay out this, this plan and this idea of where he wanted me to be and where he wanted me to go and what he wanted me to do. And um, I wasn't necessarily on board. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't jumping for joy, you know, to be truthful with you. I wasn't like, yeah. But, you know, it's sometimes you get to the most brokenness. I remember my mom used to say when we was a kid, you're like, mom, what are we eating? She'd say, you eating this? And you'd be like, I don't want that. And then she'll be, you ain't hungry. You know what I'm saying? The response is, you must not be hungry. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, it was, it was that space when you get to your, your lowest and when you're that broken, you know, I was pretty much at a space where I was like, God, listen, I'll do whatever you want me to do. You know, whatever, you, whatever it is you tell me to do, I'll do it, you know? And so that usually gets you to that space. It's usually brokenness and disappointment that God uses to shape and mold us. Yeah. And I think sometimes we want to avoid the disappointment. We want to avoid the brokenness. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's actually a part of the journey. Um, the brokenness is uh, one of those elements that you actually kind of need yeah. to, to stay grounded sometimes. And I think often we just, we just try to avoid that so often. What, what about the times where you felt like your expectations were too high or too unrealistic? Um, have you ever, have you ever dealt with anything? I know I have, I've, I've had some high expectations just because, and here, here's one of the reasons why for me personally is because I think God, you know, you see God do these great things in your life or you see him do great things for people around you. And you see that he's, you know, just ordered your steps and, and blessed you. And you think that I've said this on a previous episode of my, of the podcast, he's Santa Claus or he's a genie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if I want it, if God has given me this longing, it must be for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, not to boast, but I've been, though I can have really high expectations, I guess I'm one of those people that go, okay, that didn't work out. Then the next thing, you know, mm -hmm. I, it's like, I have this, this, this space where I can move forward, you know, um, um, Jay-Z had this line in one of his songs where he says, difficult takes a day, impossible takes a week. Mm -hmm. Like, I just got a perspective sometimes that goes, just because that next, that, this thing didn't work out doesn't mean I stop hoping for the next thing, right? right. And so you do, I, I mean, the, the, the example I just gave you were high expectations. I thought I would have this. And so I think it's different to have high expectations and, or to have, there's a difference between having high expectations and having misplaced expectations. Like Good. God is saying, hey, I could, my expectations were high, but I was in the wrong field. Like in essence, he's saying, listen, I don't want the rest of your life to be a hip hop artist, right? I got something else for you. And so that's when you find disappointed when you, you got high expectations in an area or in a space that you're no longer supposed to be in. That's yeah. different. But I think once you get over into your lane, I think it's imperative that you have high expectations. I think it's important that you shoot for the stars. I mean, I think, I think there, is, there is a necessity for risk, and, right, and risk is part of shooting for, reaching for something that's so far out there, right, that, that everybody else thinks you're crazy for going after it, you know? Okay. So I think that's important. I think you're only disappointed when you're in a particular lane or you got an expectation. Maybe sometimes we have an expectation of someone that we're with or dating mm -hmm. and ultimately that ain't who you're supposed to be with, you know, mm -hmm. and you get disappointed because you got mm -hmm. high expectations for the wrong person, right? Yeah. You, you need yeah. to get in your lane. And I think once you're in your lane, then, then shoot for the stars. 
Yeah, that is so important. And what you learned, we talked about brokenness earlier and, and things of that nature. What you learned when you were in the wrong lane definitely transfers when you get into the right one. Um, Cause you have lessons that you can take with you and reflect on. I'd like to, I know, you know, with the podcast talking about excellence and, and a lot of the feedback that I've been getting from so many of the listeners is the, the idea that excellence is not perfection. And I, and I push that a lot, yeah. but I also like to define mediocrity as the enemy of excellence. Right. Um, do you think that mediocrity, especially as we navigate, you know, different seasons and we look at, you know, uh, seasons of disappointment uh, or, you know, back to back consistently, or we look at seasons where we've had pretty much, you know, decent and up to high expectations and those things have been accomplished. Do you think that in any of that, that mediocrity can be avoided? I mean, I definitely think a mediocrity can be avoided. I mean, John Maxwell talks a lot about culture and shifting your culture, right? Yeah. So I think a lot of that has to do with, with your culture, like your environment. I think um, um, when I speak about culture, I'm speaking about, you know, development and improvement and, and thinking differently. And I think sometimes, I think being mediocre is a culture. I think it's a, a space that you can be in. I think it can be something that you're surrounded by. Mm -hmm. And I think if you want to see yourself achieve something more, achieve greatness, sometimes you got to shift the culture. Like we talked about that earlier, mm -hmm. that sometimes, because mediocre can be disappointing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. for it can be disappointing. And so when you, when you decide that I'm, I'm starting to get fed up in the space, it's time to make a shift. It's time to leave this culture of being subpar and being mediocre and move to a different, different one. And I, and I know that's easier said than done. I get it. I'm, yes. I'm not, I, I understand that it takes work. It takes effort. Um, but I think one of the greatest feelings in the world is accomplishing goals and is accomplishing something that's in front of you. And so I think it's definitely feasible to, to change your culture. Yes, it's hard, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. And so I believe you have to begin to change the, the normal. We talked about expectations. You have to begin to expect more of yourself. You got to begin to expect more of those around you and not in a, in a tyrant way. I mean, we've been watching, I've been watching the last dance mm -hmm. every, every Sunday. And, and there's some, some spaces where I'm slightly disappointed with how they have made this idea of being a tyrant the 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 standard for leadership and that's that's not okay i mean like i love mike and his game like a lot of other basketball fans but he was a jerk <laughs> was saying, that's, that's not okay he was, a, he was in a season Corey. He was in this season <laughs> listen everybody got a different viewpoint what i'm saying is i don't need i don't have to be a jerk to be a good leader that's right no. that, that's, that's and, and 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 now but but i, I do value the culture he was trying to build that he pursued as an athlete. I, I value that. I don't value the, I don't believe we have to treat people as subpar exactly. because we don't want a subpar culture. Exactly. I believe we treat people with dignity and, and with respect and, and push them to move. I think, I think about five things in changing your culture. I think one is you gotta see it. You gotta know what you want. You gotta see what it is you want. I think number two is you gotta teach that. So I think someone like Mike, his goal was trying to teach this ideal of an excellent culture. I think you gotta model it. Mike talked about in, 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 in the documentary, like I never asked him to do anything I wasn't doing myself. So he was modeling that idea. I think you gotta celebrate it. When you, see, when you see things happening the way they should be happening, you celebrate those things. You talk about those things. You say, man, look at this. Look at what's happening here. Look at them. And then lastly, you gotta prioritize it. You gotta make it something that's extremely important. And I believe Mike, Michael Jordan was doing all of those things that we just talked about. I just think we can do those things in love and concern for people in the process. Now, some people may not agree with that and I'm okay with that, but that's, that's my take on that. Yeah, I, I agree with you too. And I think I've definitely seen it as a, as a leader, as a business owner, as a professor, and just in, in various aspects of life and even in family, you know, yeah. it's, it's a reflection in family. 
as well. You mentioned a lot about culture and I love that you uh, brought up the Last Dance documentary or, or series because I've been watching it too. I've been more so binge watching it though when I you know, watch other stuff. But I, I, I had my own takeaways from that as well. And one of the things that stood out to me is you know, reflecting back on childhood and seeing remembering rather how popular and how in demand Michael Jordan was at that time, he covered almost every single corner of pop culture. And he was extremely influential. And we think about expectations and disappointment. I want to ask you this from the perspective of an artist, an entrepreneur, a minister, and, and even from a, from a ministry perspective, as you interact with your, uh, the people that you minister to and your members at your church, how do you see pop culture kind of setting us up for expectations and disappointments? What, what in pop culture adds to our angst or maybe adds to the level of success that we could have? Yeah. What are your thoughts? Man, I think it's, everywhere. I mean, social media is a, a, plays a huge role in that, you know, because you only get snapshots of people's lives and you only get their best when you see them on social media. And so as a result, if we're not careful, we can begin to be in pursuit of those things um, or, and, and not quite know the, the struggle and the hardship that comes with that. One of the things that you do get to see in the series, the Last Dance series, is that Mike is laying out, this is what I had to go through to get here. Mm -hmm. And one of, his, one of his points was, it's tough for these guys to tell me what shouldn't be when they didn't go through what I went through to get to this space. And so I think you can get a very incomplete picture of what it takes to, to be excellent or what it takes to even be mediocre if you're just paying attention to culture, you know, just, yeah. just popular culture and what you may see online, because there are a lot of mediocre people that put up their best moments and you, you don't believe they, they're mediocre, right? So true. And there are some people that are excellent and they put up maybe small moments and you may assume it's easier than what it truly is to achieve what they have achieved, right? And so, and I, and I know that's, I know that's true for pastors, right? You can pay attention to what other pastors may be doing. And especially if you're watching some of the mega churches and some of the uh, situations where they got a lot going. And if you're not careful, you, be, you can find yourself in pursuit of numbers and prestige and you miss your true role as being one that shepherds people, right? In your community. And so, you can watch what's going on. And if you're not careful, you find yourself in pursuit of something that God never really intended for you to pursue. And, and I'm not saying having, you know, uh, a large congregation of people to, to, to be, to hear you and to be influenced and to be um, encouraged by the truth of what the gospel says. That's that I believe that's amazing. That's awesome. Right. But that doesn't mean that's what we're all called to. Right? It, you are success is not determined by the number of followers or the number of members. Success is determined, especially in the spiritual realm, by growth. Like who's yeah. growing, right? who's yeah. developing, who is multiplying, who is going from this place and, and actually succeeding and seeing others' lives be changed and transformed, not through who you are, but through who Christ is. Yeah. And so that's, that's a completely different thing. And so you're having to reel yourself in all the time. Now, am I one who tries to stay connected to, to culture and, 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 and what's happening and what's going on? And, and am I, I can be, I, on a Sunday morning, this is one of maybe a few places that you can hear about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Tupac in the same sermon. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that should happen, I believe, if you're trying to stay connected and reach those within your community. But, you know, I, I, I do think the trappings of this world and, and, and what it lays out to you can be very sticky if mm -hmm. you aren't. And what do you say to 
anyone in a leadership position and leadership, not necessarily, you know, leading a flock or leading a business, but just someone in leading a household, right? Um, how do you help just the everyday person navigate um, expectations and disappointments? I, here's what I, here's what I would say. And, I'm, and, and I hope this is be extremely helpful. I'm going to share just words and then I'll kind of count on those. I think you need to prepare, prepare. I think you need to share. I think you need to remember. I think you need to submit, grow, and hope. All right, let me, let me, let me expand those. I think we need to do a better job of preparing for disappointment. I just think you need to be realistic that life doesn't always go the way that we want it to go. That's just a hard lesson that we all need to learn that it doesn't always go the way we want to go. That disappointment happens in the real world. It's just what it is. But I think what helps us is being, being certain to share our disappointments. We, have to, we, we need to be able to voice those. We need to be able to communicate. We need to be able to tell people, but more than anything, you need to be able to tell the Lord about those disappointments. I think you need to be able to get before them and voice, God, I'm disappointed. I'm, I'm pissed. I'm not happy with how things are going. I think you can, I think if we go through the Psalms, uh, the spiritual word for that would be lament, that, mm -hmm. that David is lamenting a lot, that he is talking a lot about his frustrations and being mad and how he feels like people have treated him. And he's, he's frustrated, right? But I also think we need to remember, we need to remember who God is, right? And so for some of us, we don't, we don't know. We don't have a working understanding of God's greatness and goodness. If you don't, if you don't know, you need to know, right? You need to know his goodness. So for, for those that do know, you need to remember. You need to remember the moment. Sometimes we can forget. I love my favorite Michael Jackson song is, do you remember the time? <laughs> you need, do you remember the time when he, he brought you out? Do you remember the time when he made a way for you? Do you remember the time when things looked really, really bad and he came through for you? You need to remember. And in that remembering, you need to submit. You need to humble yourself. You need yes. to humble yourself under a great and amazing God and say, you know what? Yeah, I, I lost sight of that. You know, sometimes as a parent, you got to remind your kids, like, you know who you're talking to? You remember who you're talking to? And in that moment, what they're really saying is, once you remember, submit, break down, <laughs> fold, because you're talking to your mama, you're talking to your dad, you need to do that. And then from those experiences, you need to grow. Um, use disappointment as a way to grow in sanctification and grow in service and grow in your care and concern for other people. Don't be stuck there, grow from that. And then finally, you need to hope. Um, have hope in, in, in who God is. Have hope in what you've seen. Have hope in humanity. Have hope in the fact that there is good that exists. Yeah, in, in the midst of a lot of bad, there is good. Yeah. And sometimes there are things that happen that cause our hope to be dashed. Mm -hmm. Don't let it remain there, right? Come back and be hopeful. Yeah. yeah, that's so good. I think that in this present season of everything that's going on with pandemic, um, it's difficult to be able mm -hmm. to do. It's so difficult to be able to do and it's stretching us in ways that, that for generations we've not experienced. Yeah. Um, and I think also we are challenged to be able to be more of what you just mentioned. We're challenged to be able to, um, to, to reflect. We're challenged. We're kind of being forced to do that right now. Uh, yeah. We're being forced to think about things in a new way. Uh, we're being forced to, um, to let go of the expectations, you know, going to, well, you're in Florida, but going to the beach or yeah. even, I don't know, you all still, still might not go to the beach, of course, but being able to go on vacation or being able to take a flight. I know me, I'm having to sit still and I, and I don't mind sitting still. I actually do. I love being at home. Um, but, but to be a, the option, right. To go to the gym, the option to go to brunch or all those things like, God is really showing us who he is and he's showing us his power in this particular situation. And one thing I want to add to what you said is that you, you mentioned, I can't remember at which, which iteration it was, but I can truly say that for me 
and maybe you can co-sign on this too. But for me, some of my biggest wins have come from some of my biggest disappointments. And I have seen God move when I have surrendered the ex- certain expectations and allowed myself to kind of be in the disappointment. I have seen him move in such a mighty way post that experience, right? When I move away from what I thought or when I move away from uh, the idea of what uh, maybe society or my circle or a certain circle of people or cultural things have kind of uh, influenced you, influenced me by. I have seen him move in the mightiest way after the disappointment and coming out of the disappointment. And once that thing passed, yeah. uh, that's been so amazing. <laughs> yes. I mean, where I am now is, is, is a true example of that. I mean, yeah, it was, yeah I, I started with some disappointment. And I couldn't imagine being anywhere else at this point. I couldn't imagine being yeah. doing what I'm doing at this point. And it's clear to me on a daily basis that I was called to do exactly what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm in, I'm in where I'm supposed to, I'm in my season, so to speak, you know, yeah. uh, can God move me and to something else? Yes. Is that very possible? Yes. But right now I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. So you, you're, I, 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 the last word I think you said was hope earlier. And in so many ways, you're, you're kind of this hope dealer, if you will, whether it's through your music or through ministry, and even with the people around you that you pour into and your family and all of that, um, how do you maintain your own standard of excellence? What does that look like for you? Um, I think um, one is, Keep, continue to have high expectations. But I think part of that is accountability. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you need a, a group of people around you that also are shooting for more, you know? I, I think my culture needs to be different. So I'm, I'm often seeking to surround myself with the right people, um, with the right voices, the right insight, um, wise individuals um, that could be um, not just encouraging and a great sounding board, but um, one that values relationship and community mm-hmm. and values speaking into my life. And I value them speaking into my life. Um, I think that's a pursuit. I think above all, first, me having to remain grounded in a sense of understanding who God is, um, how I got to where I am, you know? So, so for me, even remembering, like, sometimes we can get, we can, we can read our own press. We can read our own clippings and go, oh, I've been, I've done this and I've been able to do this and I've accomplished this. And so if you get caught, you know, peeking, mm-hmm. you know, you, you may find yourself believing it. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and what I've had to go is all I am and all I have is because of who God is and what he's done in my life. And I, I just cannot lose sight of that. Outside of him, I don't deserve to have or to be doing what I'm doing. Like I'm, cats be looking at me like, yo, Corey, man, how you become a pastor? And I'm like, listen, bro, I'm the last guy <laughs> that probably should be here. Uh, but the beauty is God uses the broken mm-hmm. thing he uses the foolish things of this world to yeah. shame the wise. And so he's taken one that is foolish. I was just talking just yesterday on, on Instagram Live about wisdom. And I was saying those that see themselves as wise are fools. Mm-hmm. And those that know themselves to be a fool is wise. Sure. I think a lot of times it's being aware of who you are. Self-awareness. I think that's the thing that I'm always pressing towards is knowing myself more. And I think knowing who God is, knowing what the work that has happened through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, being aware of that, I become more aware of my own identity, more aware of my own brokenness. And I think the more I become aware of my own flaws, my own brokenness, the better person I become because then I'm not fooled. I think our issue often is we don't see ourselves as we are. We see ourselves as we hope to be or as we want to be. And that's an illusion. 
You know what I'm saying? Like you're, you're not that person yet, right? You need to be real and go, no, this is the person that I am. And so when I know who I truly am, then I know how to proceed, how to walk forward, how to, to find myself invested and find myself entrenched in the love and the grace of God. And I think in finding myself and resting in that place, mm-hmm. I become a better Corey, I become a better husband, I become a better father, I become a better pastor as a result. Mm-hmm. And, and I can make a lot more impact from that space than I can from any other space. That's beautiful. And you mentioned your live, I was watching. And uh, yesterday I, I pulled up your Instagram just now. So as folks wanna follow, they can follow you at C Michael Sanders on Instagram um, and you have a weekly, you do a weekly live, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and so I was watching the one that you were mentioning about talking about wisdom and that was an excellent devotional. And you, you did, you talked about uh, the, uh, the multitude of counsel, right? And mm-hmm. that the proverb, Proverbs talked about, uh, mm-hmm. talks about, and you mentioned a really important word just now, accountability. And then in a recent conversation, I was telling probably, I think it may have been with, with my mom that um, if I realize and that for myself and as I interact with people that I love, if I don't hold you accountable, I'm not loving you the way God wants me to. Yes. And I also need the people around me to hold me accountable as well. Mm-hmm. And not just assume that, I'm going to be pursuing excellence just out of my on my own volition, right? Um, and so it's important that that you have to be wise enough to know that through expectations and through disappointments, that that accountability and having people who hold you accountable uh, is so important. That that's a level of wisdom that I, I feel like we we kind of miss right now especially the younger generation we miss we we it's almost as if we believe or feel that any slight accountability is criticism or judgment or um you know it, it, it makes me uncomfortable that that we feel that way because if 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 no one is holding me accountable how am i going to get better yes Yes. How am I going to get better? I have to be wise enough to know who I allow to hold me accountable and how I even hold myself accountable, you know? Right. No, I think wisdom is the key. I talk about it being skill for life. I mean, wisdom is yeah. skill for life. And so a part of that goal for me is connecting with uh, young people, young professionals that are always, you're pretty much asking the question, what do I do? What do I do about this? What do I do about dating? What do I do about a job change? What do I do about career? I mean, we're always asking that simple question. Life isn't made up of uh, a bunch of big choices. Like you don't, you don't make a choice of who I'm gonna marry every day. You don't make a choice about what job I'm gonna have every day. Those are huge choices. Life is made up of the small, seemingly insignificant choices that we make. And so those are the ones that make the greatest difference. Yeah. Make the right choice there will dictate where you end up with a spouse, where you end up in your career, where you end up in, in life in general, when you can wisely respond to those questions in your life. Yeah. And it's difficult to do that when you do not, like we talked about Proverbs eleven fourteen. you don't have a multitude of counsel. You mm-hmm. need people around you that come from different walks of life. And, and so because we live in a society that, that encourages individualism yeah. on, on so many different levels that we assume we can do this on our own. And, and it's not possible. No, no one that has achieved greatness will tell you they did that by themselves. No. Like it's, it's not going to happen. I love, like we were just talking about the last dance, but you cannot talk about Michael Jordan without talking about Scott. Pippen. It's impossible. It's, it's impossible. impossible. So that, that's, that's community. That, that's what that means. And that's beneficial. And we talk a lot about that, that the point is driving home that two heads are better than one. Yeah. Three, better than two. Four heads are better than three. That's just the truth of the matter. And I know sometimes we want things to move quickly and we're in this microwave age and sometimes excluding a number of people from decision-making makes that decision-making speed up and go faster. Um, um, But a lot of times, the quicker that decision is made, 
that the, the making that decision in haste. You just got two people. You got the hasty people and you got the hesitant people. You got to find a balance. You got to find right. a balance. That's right. And and speak to that as a husband and a father of four. Uh, four, right? Five. Wait. Oh, the new baby. There's a new baby. Yeah, there's a new baby. I forgot about the little baby. The boy. He's a little boy. I haven't met him. Oh, jeez. That's right. Five. How do you manage? <laughs> how, do you, how do you manage expectations and disappointment and then maintain a level of excellence in, in your household? Yeah. I, I got an amazing wife. Let me make that one. Let me make that 2000% clear. Amen. Is the most talented individual in our home, hands down. Um, she is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and we are different. We are so different. We are so different. My wife would be on the hesitant end and I would be on the hasty end. I am the the risk taker and she is the cautious one. She is absolutely phenomenal. And, and she helps to, to bring a lot of balance in a lot of places that, that I may not have, I may be missing it, you know? And so she's an, uh, an, an amazing mom. Um, and, and she is what helps keep, you know, keep that together. I mean, we, we're a team. We, we are a, a phenomenal team. Um, we are Shaq and Kobe. I mean, like, I mean, like, and, and, and for all of it, you know, we, we're just the Shaq and Kobe that stayed together. <laughs> yeah, I, I was about to say, Shaq and Kobe had some difficulties. They did. And, and so did we. <laughs> let, me, let me make it clear. Yeah. Marriage isn't always like peaches and cream. It's not always everything you want it to be. And I think you need disappointment and adversity, like we just talked about. Some of our best moments in our marriage have come out of disappointment has come out of that that very move to san antonio was one of the most significant turning points in our marriage i mean it was it was it was a it was such a disappointment that it drew us so much closer together than we had ever been before we were i think up to that point we was like two individuals like kind of we were on we were running side by side but we were like this huge space she was kind of doing her thing i was kind of doing my thing and it was in that moment that it kind of just we kind of converged you know and so it 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 meant meaning we needed to we need to see it you know i, I think about Shaq, who was like big and 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 intimidating you know and he was all these different things and so in moments he was just like yo this is my show you know i'm the i'm the king and Kobe was kind of like this young upstart that with all of this amazing talent, it was like, yo, why should it be your team? Like, I'm the talented one here, you know? And so you, we had those moments where we had to go, nope, we're in this together. You know, we're on this, this same page. And I think she has helped. I've helped in a lot of, we've, we've helped each other in a lot of ways kind of maintain. And God has just been so gracious to us. And yeah. so the new little one coming along has just flow right in. It's just flow right into the flow with the others. And um, God loves us. Yeah, I love that. God loves us. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. And the, the I think what's so interesting about all of that is that um, the, the partnership, we talked about accountability earlier, but the partnership and being able to navigate the expectations and the disappointments within the partnership, right? And, and, and seeing the other side of that is so critical and acknowledging that, you know, in marriage and in family, you go through different seasons and different shifts and how important it is to try to navigate that with patience and love and grace. And as much as, <laughs> as much as you can, um, what, what words of affirmation hold kind of stick to you when you're really trying to pursue excellence? Um, how are you affirming yourself as when it's okay? When, yeah, it's okay. I mean, I, I know that that seems so simplistic. And it is. That's very simple. It's okay. Okay. Um, and, and not it's okay in a way like it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. right? But it's okay that you're not today where you want to be it's okay that things have not transpired at the speed that you want them to transpire it's okay 
that things get ugly and things get hard. And the reason I can say it's okay is because God is in control. Like he is sovereign and he is faithful. And, and that's, you got to trust in that. I mean, I get it. If you don't trust in that, it could be extremely daunting, right? And you can find yourself in space where you like, I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, when you're, when you're serving people, like humanity can get really ugly. People can get really ugly. We, we do a feeding um, every Tuesday and Thursday, just trying to uh, bring some hope and relief during the pandemic. But people aren't always very nice. Even as you are serving and helping and loving them, people sometimes have a sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you give me this? And why didn't you do this, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it can sometimes push you to a space like, ma'am, I'm helping you. Yeah. I'm, I'm serving you and this is the way you're gonna respond. And if you're not careful, you can allow resentment and bitterness to start to seep in drip into your life and now you're cynical and 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 frustrated and like i talked about early on you're allowing minor irritations to become major issues and you have to come back to center and go it's okay mm -hmm. very simple i know but it's it's words of encouragement for me and in times where my expectations are high and I am frustrated because it has not, I have not achieved what I wanted to achieve I, or I haven't accomplished or it, the time frame that I've set up is not the time frame that God has set up. Mm -hmm. um, and it's okay. Yeah. I don't know about anyone else, but I believe Aura and Rosie Mae would be proud <laughs> our grandmothers, great grandmothers would be proud to hear us um, share wisdom, share experiences, give testimonies, uh, pour into people, assess where we are, you know, think about accountability and things of that nature, and really truly pursue excellence. Uh, as much as possible. So I'm grateful for our time together. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. I'm grateful that things have transitioned so like well in your ministry and that things are successful as they are. And I'm grateful that you get to make such an impact on people because it's in you, right? It's in you. It's there. Yeah. It's been birthing me. So I'm grateful. I really am. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I want everybody to again follow you on Instagram, see Michael Sanders, and then you would you would appreciate this. There is a seasons and shifts playlist on Spotify. Some okay. songs, yay! Uh, some songs that I curated okay. and collected that all have the theme of seasons and shifts. Of course, the majority of them Christian and gospel, but of yeah. course, there's some th just a little bit thrown in there. India, I read, let us see. Uh, Stevie Wonder, some folks like that. Come on, Stevie. Um, Come on. Yeah. Happy birthday, Stevie. Absolutely. So <laughs> I wanted to let everybody know that. And um, is there anything that you want to share with um, the audience? No, I mean, that's it. I, I would love to have people follow me on Instagram, or you can check out my website, cmichaelsanders.com. Um, and just am grateful for just this opportunity. Uh, you are doing a fabulous job fabulous job and so i'm it is so hilarious to see where we've come from yep. uh where we are today. <laughs> <laughs> and it's absolutely phenomenal uh, you know i get to obviously pay attention and even watch from afar and just have loved what you've been able to do over the years and the transitions that you've made uh from publicist to entrepreneur or college professor and all that cool stuff and so um god loves us and it's just beautiful to see and i like you say our parents and grandparents um are i'm sure smiling in so many different ways at just how uh god has been able to use us and so i'm excited for the future and what he'll do right here in in miami-dade county and what he'll do in in nashville what is the county in nashville i forget davidson <laughs> County. Yes, it is. Yeah, David. So, 
But yeah. what, I mean, when and when you think about it, though, even though that's where we're based, we really have a reach that's oh, oh global. global, global, yeah, global. and I, and that's a blessing. Yeah, it is. That's um, a blessing. My favorite place is South Africa that I've been able to reach and touch. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you, man. Right before I went, I went last yep. year. You were there about a month or so before I went. Yep, I, I plan to be back. Uh, yeah. So I, I love. Oh, I love South Africa. Oh my. I'm here. I love it. So, yeah. so yeah, it's it's it, a global impact has been not what I've expected. So that's, that's one of those things where you didn't expect it and God has done beyond your expectations mm -hmm. exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. Ask or think. Yes. Given a platform in places that I never thought I would have a platform. And I'm, I see he's done the same for you. So. Absolutely. And I'm grateful. Um, thank you everybody for watching. Uh, really grateful for Corey joining us. Uh, feel free to follow him again on Instagram and uh, we'll see you again. So.